Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Google has fixed some Android flaws that allow code execution with high system rates. Publishers are suing and trying to shut down the Internet Archive. Elon Musk makes getting humans to Mars his top priority. We'll tell you how he wants to do it. Google Maps has launched new features to help travelers specifically during the coronavirus pandemic. Lenovo plans to sell Ubuntu on more ThinkPads and ThinkStations this summer. And the U.S. military could lose the Space Force trademark to Netflix, the Netflix series of the same name. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Google has pushed out security patches for dozens of vulnerabilities in its Android mobile operating system, two of which could allow hackers to remotely execute malicious code with extremely high system rights. In some cases, the malware could run with highly elevated privileges, a possibility that raises the severity of the bugs. That's because the bugs located in the Android system component could enable a specially crafted transmission to execute arbitrary code within the context of a privileged process. In all, Google released patches for at least 34 security flaws, although some of the vulnerabilities were present only in devices available from manufacturer Qualcomm. Two vulnerabilities ranked as critical in Google's June security bulletin are among four system flaws located in the Android system. The other two are ranked with a severity of high. The critical vulnerabilities reside in Android versions 8 through the most recent release of 11. An advisory from the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center said, these, vulnerab these vulnerabilities could be exploited through multiple methods such as email, web browsing, and MMS when processing media files. Depending on the privileges associated with the application, an attacker could then install programs, view, change, or delete data, or create new accounts with full user rights. Vulnerabilities with a severity rating of high affected the Android media framework, the Android framework, and the Android kernel. Other vulnerabilities were contained in components shipped in devices from Qualcomm. The two Qualcomm-specific critical flaws reside in closed-source components. The severity of other Qualcomm flaws were rated as high. Anyone with an Android-powered device should check in settings to see if fixes or updates are available. Several of the world's largest publishers have sued the Internet Archive for its emergency library of 1.3 million books, claiming the organization is engaging in willful digital piracy on an industrial scale. Last week, the Hatchet Book Group, HarperCollins Publishers, John Wiley & Sons, and Penguin Random House sued the nonprofit better known for its Wayback Machine archive of web pages for copyright infringement. Infringement, they argued, is intentional and systematic. We understand that publishers hope to shut down the .org. The Internet Archive invited the ire of publishers and authors back in March when it decided to lift restrictions on the digital copies of library books it has acquired and scanned. Anyone that registers with the site can take out any of 1.3 million books. The complaint states, although the Internet Archive claims the real figure is 1.4 million, the Internet Archive is registered as a library but has asserted an untested theory called controlled digital lending that argues libraries are not infringing on copyright when they make digital copies of books they possess. Publishers and authors have been unhappy about this approach but held fire while the Internet Archive restricted the number of ebooks it would make available at any given time to the number of physical books it possessed. That restriction went out of the window in March, however, when the Internet Archive decided that due to the coronavirus, it would make all its ebooks available without a waiting list. The Authors Guild said the organization has no rights whatsoever to these books, much less to give them away indiscriminately without consent of the publisher or author. And the Association of American Publishers called the move the height of hypocrisy and a cynical play to undermine copyright. 
The lawsuit filed in New York calls the electronic copies of the books of the Internet Archive that the Inter Internet Archive has made digital bootlegs. It goes on, the Internet Archive not only acts entirely outside any legal framework, it does so flagrantly and fraudulently, and it proceeds despite actual notice that its actions constitute infringement. In response, the Internet Archive's founder, Brewster Kale, has posted a brief blog post in which he notes that the organization is disappointed by the lawsuit and claims to be supporting publishers, authors, and readers. He says publishers suing libraries for lending books, in this case protected digitized versions, and while schools and libraries are closed, is not in anyone's interest. Having completed its first human launch, SpaceX founder and CEO Elon Musk says the company is now focusing on developing its next generation spacecraft, Starship. A couple weeks back, NASA and SpaceX successfully launched astronauts from U.S. soil for the first time in almost a decade. According to an internal email sent to staff, Musk said that the development on Starship is now the primary focus for the company, alongside the safe return of the Crew Dragon from the International Space Station. Starship was unveiled last September and is designed to carry a crew and cargo to the Moon, Mars, or anywhere else in the solar system, according to the billionaire. Musk's intention is to make the spaceflight vehicles uh, as reusable as planes. Four years ago, the billionaire outlined his vision of building a colony on Mars in our lifetimes, with the first rocket propelling humans to the red planet by 2025. For many years, the company used an image of the Martian surface being terraformed, turned Earth-like, in its promotional material. However, a NASA-sponsored spa study published in 2018 dismissed these plans as impossible with today's technology. Last year, Musk tweeted he believed it was possible to make a self-sustaining city on Mars by 2050 if we start in five years. According to SpaceX's most recent detailed plans, published in 2016, there are two phases for the first human transmissions as part of a programming to colonize Mars. The first will take place in 2022, when at least two Starship rockets will land on Mars. These will be unmanned spacecraft, but containing drones and robots, which will confirm whether there are sufficient resources of water on the planet and check for any geographic risks. The second phase will start in 2024 when another pair of Starship spacecraft will land on Mars with the first astronauts. These spacecraft will bring equipment and supplies as well as a number of production plants for ongoing life on the planet, as well as develop a base of operations. Separately, the successful mission for NASA has given the company a boost ahead of the U.S. Space Agency's new moon landing program, which will return humans to the moon by 2024 and lay the groundwork for a manned mission to Mars. NASA's new Artemis program is named after the mythological sister of Apollo, the first moon mission's namesake, and is intended to fly the first woman to the moon. The Artemis program will be used as a way to develop something called the Lunar Gateway, essentially a version of the ISS but orbiting the moon, allowing it to be used as a stepping stone for missions destined for Mars. NASA has given SpaceX and Blue Origin the nod to develop its new lunar landers, which will take the first woman and the next man to the surface of the moon. Thanks, Becca. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, our crypto correspondent Robert Koenig is here to share the status of the cryptocurrency market. And Becca has more tech news. Stick around. Welcome to the Crypto Corner and welcome to the weekly crypto news. And as usual, let's take a look into how the market performed over the last seven days. As you can see, we've got seven projects that gained over 15%. Uh, the winner is Wax with almost 60%, Loopring with 50%, and so on. Most of these projects are really serious and good projects with huge teams behind them, which is great news for the industry. On the losing side, there are only two projects above 15%. One is Hex, the other one is Hedge Trade, um, uh, which uh, is, yeah, 
uh, it just shows how the market is performing at the moment. It's on the up. Next headline is Bitcoin Core released uh, the version 0 0.2. There's one feature in it that it's worth mentioning, which is the ASMAP. And that is a, a software, part of the software that prevents attacks by uh, nation states. And <clears throat> this feature makes it possible to limit the number of nodes that are connected to any specific autonomous system. So previously a country, a huge country could attack the Bitcoin blockchain. This can now be prevented. So that's also good news. Next one is a small uh, project that everybody can use, create your own token. So with this software, and I'll put a link down below, um, you can create your own token. So you, you enter the token name, the token symbol, uh, the number of decimals you want to have, uh, the maximum supply, you click on create token, and voila, you have your own uh, token created. Uh, you can put that token even on an exchange and create li liquidity. Um, so if you've got a great idea, this is a perfect tool that you can use to put that uh, idea into practice. Or if you just want to have a present, a birthday present, there you have got another idea. Next one is PwC, one of the largest accounting firms. Um, they created a report, a crypto hedge fund report. And I just, uh, I will also put a link of that report in the, in the description down below. <clears throat> the highlights here are from my point of view that, um, of those uh, hedge funds that they analyzed, 97% uh, hold Bitcoin. I wonder what what the other three are doing. But anyway, 97% hold Bitcoin, followed by Ethereum, XRP, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, and EOS. Um, no other coins are mentioned uh, in that uh, report that are worth uh, any substantial amount. Um, those uh, hedge funds are mainly... Uh, operating in the US and the, the UK, the two big financial hubs in the world. And they're based in the Cayman Islands, US and British Virgin Islands, so low tax havens. Uh, the market is uh, increased by 30%, although that's still very small. It increased from 2 billion to 3 billion uh, this year. <coughs> As I said it's still uh, a small market. Next one is uh, DeFi, which is my favorite subject, because that one DeFi in itself will start the next uh, bull run in our market. I'm pretty sure about that. <clears throat> if you look here, that Lending Club, which is a big peer-to-peer -peer lender here in the US, they originated $250 million loans in the first five years. Well, Maker, which is our um, peer-to-peer lender, uh, originated $2.4 billion uh, loans in the last uh, uh, well, five years. If I look into DeFi market cap, which is like coin market cap, but only for the T, uh, DeFi industry, you can see that um, we are running on $2.2 billion uh, market cap at the moment. Uh, MakerDAO, of course, is the number one, but everything is green, as you can see here. Uh, so, and that also reflects on what I see out there in the market. I went to see a few um, forums um, DeFi forum or finance forums, um, the, the, they had no idea on what is going on in our market. They don't understand this here. They don't know what the smart contract is. They don't understand DeFi. They always translate it back to what they're accustomed to with a middle person uh, creating the market, but don't understand that this can be done much, much easier and by far more efficient than what we've uh, seen in the traditional system. So this one here, the DeFi market, is one to take care and watch. Anyway, that's it from me from this week. I hope you're all well, and I wish you the best, and thank you very much for watching. And see you next week, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder to those of you who are watching at home, we are not providing financial advice here on the show. We're just simply giving you the facts about the cryptocurrency market and leaving the decisions up to you. Just be mindful, cryptocurrency is an ever-changing market. It's always volatile. And we suggest that you only invest what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Traveling during the pandemic can be tough. 
That's why the latest version of Google Maps for Android and iOS has several features that might help travelers get around safely. Now, when you look up public transit directions, Maps will show COVID-19 related alerts. Google points out that data will only be available where it can get info from the local transit agencies and only on trips that are likely to be affected by COVID-19 restrictions. These alerts are rolling out in Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Brazil, Colombia, France, India, Mexico, Netherlands, Spain, Thailand, United Kingdom, and the U.S. And Google says they're going to, they're coming to more countries soon. Maps will also display alerts when you navigate uh, to medical facilities or COVID-19 testing centers, warning you to verify eligibility and facility guidelines to avoid being turned away or causing additional strain on the local healthcare system. Alerts for medical facilities are rolling this week in Indonesia, Israel, the Philippines, South Korea, and the U.S. Alerts for testing centers will only be, be available in the U.S. Again, Google says it will only show these alerts when it can get author authoritative data from local, state, and federal governments or from their websites. Google says the app will also tell you how crowded buses, subways, and transit stations will be. Plus, you'll be able to see when a transit station has historically been less busy so you can plan ahead. Google says these features are powered by aggregated and anonymized data from users who opt in to Google location history. They'll be rolling out in the next several weeks. Finally, the app will show you driving alerts notifying you about COVID-19 checkpoints and restrictions along your route, for example, when crossing national borders. This feature will initially only be available in Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. Lenovo has announced that they're including Ubuntu as a preloaded OS option or a number on a number of their systems starting this summer. Lenovo is already well represented within the Linux hardware community, having certified a swath of its devices for various different distros over the years. And the company recently revealed plans to sell laptops preloaded with Fedora and make more firmware updates available through the vendor-neutral Linux vendor firmware service. But now it's going even further with the Linux love. Lenovo says all of its ThinkStation and ThinkPad P-Series laptops will be available to buy with Ubuntu LTS preloaded and not just a few specific configurations stashed away on a hard-to-find storage page somewhere. While the same devices can be bought with Windows 10 or Red Hat, Enterprise Linux pre-installed, it's still a major win for Ubuntu and the wider Linux community. The company also says it will upstream device drivers directly to the Linux kernel to help maintain stability and compatibility throughout the life of the workstation. Of course, it's easy enough to buy a ThinkPad running Windows and install Ubuntu manually, but the official support means buyers can be certain that all hardware works with Ubuntu out of the box. No drivers to hunt down or config files to edit. Presumably, it also means some cost savings as well, since a Windows license need not be included. Lenovo says Ubuntu LTS benefits from an extended five-year support cycle, providing increased user confidence and system stability across the deployment. Canonical, the company behind Ubuntu, performs certification and regression testing on these systems on an ongoing basis to ensure that it remains as stable as possible for end users. The United States Space Force was only announced two years ago and has yet to engage in any military operations, but the latest branch of the U.S. Armed Forces already stands to lose its first battle to Netflix's Space Force. The streaming service pre premiered its new comedy series Space Force on May 29th. The show's name has no relation to the newest organization of the U.S. military, which unveiled its official flag only two weeks earlier. Because of the common moniker, though, the United States Space Force's first battle might be a trademark war fought in court rather than in space. Attorneys for the U.S. military have done little to secure the Space Force name as a registered trademark. Netflix, however, has been far more aggressive and has already locked down the rights to the name in several countries. Despite sharing a name, both entities have plenty of room to maneuver without evoking much confusion. The streaming comedy is unlikely to make its viewers think they're watching a series about an actual branch of the U.S. military. 
The U.S. Space Force, meanwhile, has yet to get off the ground, both, liter both literally and figuratively. While Netflix's effort was the first to come to fruition, the U.S. Space Force was first announced by President Donald Trump in March 2018. The military branch was officially established as a formal organization last December. Netflix, meanwhile, greenlit the 10-episode series in January 2019. Created by Greg Daniel and Steve Carell, Space Force stars Carell, John Malkovich, Ben Schwartz, Diana Silvers, and Tawny Newsome. Season 1 is currently available on Netflix. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson.